Good morning, Crossroads. How are you this morning? I love it. It's men's conference this coming weekend. It's men's conference. Brothers, hey, we got a we got a truckload of guys signed up, but I imagine the final week, those of you that yet haven't signed up, I know you're going to do it because it's going to be a great weekend. We can't wait to gather here uh, Friday night and then Saturday morning. We've got a lot of great stuff planned. We're going to have fun and we're going to enjoy one another as we are in the word and song. So make sure you get signed up before you leave today and then we will see you on Friday. It sort of uh, launches us into the grow season for the fall. And when you came in, you should have been handed a, a 2022 fall grow offering brochure, which is sort of your roadmap. Everybody got one of those? Awesome. If you didn't, please grab one before you leave, because in that is all the different opportunities for grow groups, for soul care groups, for Crossroads Institute, how to get signed up into a small group. And we want every one of you to be a part of something. We're so glad that you're here uh, for a weekend service. And the second thing is to see you're a part of something where you're gathering weekly, you're with brothers and sisters, you're studying the word, you're practicing the biblical one another's. So take a look through, take a look through that. You got a few weeks to get signed up and you can get signed up online or out in the lobby. This, this weekend, also out in the lobby, we're highlighting one of our GO partners, Lifeline Global. Uh, they do ministry to men in uh, every prison in the state of California. Uh, some of our guys go here to pitch us. Uh, they go through a, a, f- a series of four books, equipping men to, uh, to, to deal with their past in many cases, certainly understand the gospel, what it looks like to be a godly man, husband, father, and uh, we're just excited to be able to partner with them. So uh, stop by, say hi, get a little bit more info about Lifeline Global. There's also a couple things coming up here, August 28th, in a few Sundays, to, uh, to help you with evangelism and just expand your heart and your mind for mission. And so in the morning of August 28th, Pastor Jim will be teaching uh, his evangelism course, giving you just real practical tips, tools to go along with making sure you've got the right content in sharing the gospel with uh, the loss that the Lord has brought into your life in a winsome, gracious, truth-filled way. If you haven't yet taken that class, please get signed up and uh, be a part of that evangelism class. And then that evening, we're going to have a time of prayer for Connect2, which is another one of our GO partners that ministers in Haiti. Of course, the last couple trips, we haven't been able to go to Haiti, but we want to continue to pray for what God is doing there, uh, Pastor Puis, and uh, when we can take a group of people back down to Haiti. So I'd love for you to join us on uh, August 28th in the evening. Fair enough? Sweet. So glad you're here. Why don't you stand to your feet as I pray for us, and we get to lift our voice in song this morning. God, how great is it to know that you do not withhold anything good from those of us who trust you. We recognize there may be some, perhaps many in this room, who feel like you've held out on them, who are going through difficult situations. And my prayer this morning is that they, as they've gathered with your people, as they come into this fellowship of praise, as they come underneath the ministry of the word, that you would remind them of your sovereign love, your divine care for them, that there is nothing that is too difficult for you, and that the promises of God would wash over all of us afresh this morning, that we would know the joy of the Lord that comes as your people gather. In your name we pray, amen. Well, church, we are going to sing to the one who came and laid his life down as a lamb and then came bursting forth from the grave as the roaring lion. He is returning for his bride, and that's what we're going to sing about this morning. Come on, he's coming on the cloud. He's coming on the cloud. Kingdoms will bow down. All will bow to him. And every day will rain. His broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord? Yeah. 
How great, how great, how great. 
never been, there will never be a God like you, a love so true. Just throw to wake 
Let's thank Him for that majesty this morning. Amen. You may go and take a seat. Is there anything like walking into the church parking lot and seeing three in and out trucks? It is like the Christian lotto and we just won it. there and sang with you and tears rolled down my, my cheeks because God is so faithful to this church and we celebrate him and him alone. Yeah. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work and his righteousness endures forever. works of his hands are faithful and just, and all his precepts are trustworthy. is his name. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all those who practice it have good understanding. His praise, his praise endures forever. I, I don't know about you, but we are uh, still living off the fumes from last weekend, and uh, God... Uh, God is so faithful to our church, and we got to celebrate him big time as a big church family last weekend, and uh, we're, we're still just, uh, just this all week just thanking the Lord for all that he's done in and through uh, this uh, uh, little imperfect church called Crossroads Community Church. So we're so glad you're with us here this morning, and we have a lot going on, and uh, not the least of which, uh, men, I just want to do another shout out. Pastor Mark already gave his pitch. This is my final pitch to you men. I, I don't know how else to tell you, but we want you there. And uh, so sign up uh, this morning uh, right after service. You won't want to miss it. Uh, Eric Tones is going to be uh, bringing the word. Some of you have heard him speak at Hume Lake. Top drawer, top drawer, communicator, and um, just solid biblically. You're going to love him. And uh, we're going to have a great time. I don't know if it's allowed, but we're going to have a lot of fun, even if it's not allowed. We're still going to have fun. Uh, the next thing I want you to uh, notice, as uh, Pastor Mark said, uh, is all the grow uh, offerings. Uh, people say it's so hard to get connected into Crossroads. Really? 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 Seriously? It's hard to find a place to get connected into Crossroads? All kinds of crazy places to get connected. All of these represent what we call grow groups. Grow groups. Um, uh, and there's all kinds of grow groups. There's the men's study, the women's study, there's a soul care, there's small groups. But we want you connected into one of these grow groups somewhere this fall so that we're all maturing in Christ. Uh, and then this morning, uh, we get to uh, kick off, and you can get your hands on, um, these journals. These are our grow journals for uh, the fall. It has all of our sermon notes in here. It has all of our reading plan, scripture reading plan. And then for those of you in small groups, it's got small group, all of its teaching. Even those of you that are not in a small group, you can track along with us uh, in these. And so we just sell these at cost. They're five bucks. And then the last journal uh, is, uh, the journal that has just the book of Romans in it. And so some of you enjoy uh, using these to take sermon notes because it gives you the passage on one side and notes on the other. And so these are five bucks um, also. So you lay down a 10. Who's on the $10 bill? Nobody knows, right? The poor guy. He's just, nobody knows who it is. But uh, lay, you lay down a $10 bill and you can pick up both of these these journals uh, here this morning. I uh, want to make you aware, uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor Scott Overby and 
uh, his wife Kim. We've sent them off on sabbatical uh, for, the next, uh, for the next four weeks for them to break away from ministry because if you know Pastor Scott, he lives at Crossroads. He's here all the time. And so we're sending them off to get a, a, a well-needed break uh, for this next four weeks. So don't bug them, all right? Uh, let, him, let him forget and just uh, be with his family and to uh, recharge his battery so he can come back to us ready to go. Um, uh, I have one last announcement, and that is in terms of the sermon. Some of you are aware of this. Many of you are not. But if you were to take your phone or digital device and get the QR code on the back of your chair, you'll see up on the screen, it always has every week a place that offers all of our sermon notes. So all the answers are all right there for you. And you can actually take notes electronically on your device. You can use your device for a good thing, not for watching fall football. You can use it for a good thing during church. Take notes, and then you can have them emailed to you or anybody else that you want emailed to. And so um, uh, somebody uh, keeps saying, you've got to keep telling people this is really a cool thing. And so if, uh, if, you, uh, if you haven't uh, made use of it, we would encourage you to do so. Well, here we uh, here we go this morning. We're, we're going to uh, work our way through this grand book, Romans, and uh, we're going to dive into the deep end of the pool. You ready to go? Yeah. All right. We're going to cover the first seven verses uh, in Romans uh, here this morning. Uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he took 13 weeks to cover the first seven verses. And so... Um, uh, you're like, boy, this sermon's going to be long. Now, I'm going to try to keep it within the, within the goalposts, but you can imagine there's a lot just right at the beginning that we got to get our arms around. So let's, let's pray together, grab a copy of the scriptures, and turn uh, with uh, me to the book of Romans. Um, just go to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and you'll find it right there. And so as you turn, let me pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the time that now we get to worship you uh, through the study of your word. And Father, what a rich book we're going to be in this morning. It has so much to say to us. And Father, uh, give us uh, spiritual ears to not just hear the words, but to allow them to be implanted into our hearts and minds. Uh, Father, may we, um, may we have a better understanding of the Apostle Paul and his heart behind this great epistle of his. May we come to love it. Uh, the way that he wrote it. And may we understand, well, may we understand the heart of the gospel in this study. We pray this in the precious and perfect name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. amen. I have an addiction, just as a way of confession, I have an addiction. I have an addiction to books, especially good books. I, I love books. I can spend a day uh, in a dark, dusty, old-used bookstore. Throw me in there and uh, just uh, throw some food every now and then, and I could live in there probably for a whole week climbing through those books, what they call a used bookstore. There's something about a book. I love the smell of books. I love the feel of the book. I love the words of the book. I love old books. I've become an Amazon junkie. Have you? Uh, Amazon is probably the greatest uh, gift to a book lover you can imagine. You, you, you have an idea of a book, you order it today, and it's on your front porch tomorrow. You talk about how pleasurable that is. That's, that's an awesome feeling. I am so addicted to it that uh, about a week ago, I opened up a package from Amazon. It was a book, and I, I didn't even know what it was, and I don't even remember ordering it. And I remember, I remember Stacy looking at me like, this is getting way out of control, Todd. You don't even remember the books that you've ordered. And I said, I know. This is embarrassing. I don't even remember ordering it. And lo and behold, I found out a week later, somebody had gifted it to me. And I missed, <laughs> I missed the gift receipt, which was very encouraging that I hadn't lost my mind that somebody else had ordered this book because I had no idea what this book was. Well, we're going to study a good book uh, starting this fall, starting this morning. We're going to study not just a good book. We're going to study a, a great book. It, it's a book, if I can point out some common things, the book comes right after the book of Acts. And before we even dive into this good book, great book, the book of Romans, I want to ask the question, do you know why Romans comes after the book of Acts? 
You know, before we even get in, let's uh, think about it. Why in the world is Romans right after the book of Acts? Why is it at the front and not, not towards the middle or maybe the end? Why is it where it is? Why doesn't the New Testament start with Romans? Well, um, some people say, well, uh, the reason they put it right after the book of Acts was simply this. It's because it's the longest book that Paul wrote. Maybe, but I'm not sure that that's reason. Some people said, well, maybe it's alphabetically. Well, (laughs) according to my alphabet, that wouldn't work because there are some things that come before R after R. Uh, maybe, Maybe it's Paul's first letter. Well, that's not true. It's not Paul's first letter. Uh, so what is the issue of why, why we have, think about it with me, we have the Gospels, the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, Behold the Lamb of God, John says, and we have the introduction of the Savior of the world in the, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, and, and then we have the book of Romans, right after, right after Jesus comes and he sets forth salvation through the cross, he comes bursting out of the tomb, spends 40 days teaching the disciples, and then woo, goes right up into heaven. And now the church is established there at Pentecost, and uh, it, is, it is contagious, it, it's a wildfire, the, the, the gospel is, the church is, and the church gets established. Uh, then we come, we come to Romans. I would venture to guess that Romans is right after Acts, which is right after the Gospels, because of its significance, because of its foundational importance, that the Apostle Paul had written this letter to the Romans, and the early church understood the significance, the profoundness of this book. It is the foundation of the church. Why? Because it's the foundation of the Gospel. It's the theology of the Gospel. And I would believe, I believe that the book of Romans is placed where it is because of its foundational purposes. Because there's not a reasonable person who can dispute that the book of Romans is one of the most powerful and most influential books that have ever been written by a human, both saved and unsaved. It is a powerful book. The impact of Romans goes unchallenged, friends. The impact of Romans goes unchallenged. Augustine, the great the theologian, he came to salvation from reading Romans 13. A Chrysostom of Constantinople, say that six times fast. He, 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 he said that he found the book so rich that he wanted to hear it every week. And he literally paid somebody to read the book of Romans to him twice a week throughout his, his ministry. He wanted to hear it read to him. Martin Luther, he was the one who said that it's the chief part of the New Testament. It's the very purest gospel. John Bunyan, John Bunyan, he, he said that Romans was the, inspiration, was the inspiration to write Pilgrim's Progress when he was in that Bedford jail. That's how significant it was. J.I. Packer says all roads in the Bible lead to Romans. John Piper says the most important theological and Christian work ever written. The English poet Taylor Coleridge says it's the profoundest book in existence. Are you fired up yet? This is a good book. This is a great book. And for us book lovers, we're about to open a really powerful book. Why? Because I believe Romans explains both the how and the why Christianity has transformed the world. I think that it it clearly lays out the gospel truth, and it is the how and the why Christianity has transformed uh, the world. Paul wrote this letter somewhere between 57 and 59 AD. That's early. It's a, but, but it's only less than 30 years after Jesus Christ was crucified. Uh, but the Romans is still a very fresh, uh, a fresh book. It, it's probably Paul's most theological, his most personal book that he ever wrote. In fact, it's comprised of what we now say 16 chapters. If you read it out loud, uh, from cover to cover, it'll only take you 60 minutes. But this book has changed the course of the world. It was Francis Bacon, the Lord Chancellor of England. Uh, he said about great human books, not just gospel books, but human books, that we should taste, that we should chew, we should swallow and digest good books. Well, friends, this morning we're going to taste, we're going to chew for a long time here. It's going to take us not months, it'll probably take us a couple years to get through this great book. But we're going to taste and chew and digest all that Paul has pinned for us. 
If you're ready to jump in, say jump. jump. Let me read our passage for us this morning. Paul writes at the opening of this grand epistle, he writes these words, Paul, the servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of the faith for the sake, for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh man, what a feast we have before us. Seven verses of introduction. And what Paul does here is in these seven verses, I think we get a really good glimpse of who this guy Paul is. Because he reveals a number of things about him as an author. He tells us, he tells us a lot of things, well, about what he's called to be and to do. And so this morning, this morning we're going to have to lift and sift uh, through all of this stuff that Paul gives us in these seven verses. And we're going to have to move briskly, so don't weigh me down, all right? <laughs> Number one, write this down. We're going to learn about Paul, six things about Paul. Number one, Paul introduces us to Paul the man. Paul the man. Notice how he starts it off. It's not complicated. He starts with one word, and it is what? Paul. Paul. You're like, should I say it? It's Paul. Paul introduces us uh, to the fact that he is the writer, the author. And remember back then, they didn't wait to sign their letters or emails at the bottom. They signed them right up at top. And so he says, he says, it's me, Paul, hello, the man. Now, you need to know a little bit about the, uh, the life of the Apostle Paul to understand the richness of Romans. The Apostle Paul actually was named Saul originally after the first king of Israel. Paul, uh, according to church historians, this is fascinating, was not physically impressive. He had bowed legs, he was bent over, and he had a hooked nose, which is a tremendous blessing to me that I have a shot at actually being helpful. Paul was not physically impressive, but he was, by his own words, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He came from the tribe of Benjamin. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He, he, he even says, I, I was righteous. I was blameless when it came to the law. Watch this. He personally trained at the feet of Gamaliel. And this, Gamaliel was this uh, high esteemed rabbi. I mean, like, like your top professor in your degree program, that's Gamaliel. He was, he was probably one of the greatest teachers of the Pharisees. And, and Saul, back then, uh, studied at his feet. Paul became an expert in Jewish law. He, he was a lawyer. He was a sharp whip. He was a quick mind. He, he understood the complexities of both the Jewish law and ultimately the theological truth of the gospel. Uh, Paul was born, this is fascinating, it wasn't a Thursday night, but I found it fascinating. Paul was born a free, he was a freeborn Roman citizen. He didn't have to buy his citizenship. He didn't have to work for it. He was born, just like you get born in America, you're born a freeborn American. He was a freeborn Roman citizen from Tarsus. And we know that became a big deal in the book of Acts because Paul used his citizenship a number of times to get him out of, well, some tight spots because he knew he had rights. And he had the freedom, because of a freeborn Roman citizen, to travel the world. He enjoyed that freedom, and he was a perfect guy to take the gospel to the ends of the earth because he was freeborn. He comes from Tarsus. You say, what's the big, big deal about Tarsus? Well, back in the day, back in the day, Tarsus was one of the three, one of the three main centers of Greek culture. There, there, was, there was Athens, there was Alexandria down in Egypt there, and there was Tarsus. These were the... Um, the cosmopolitan cities of Greek culture. This is where Greek thought and Greek writers and Greek poets and Greek professors would teach. There were high-level schools in these cities, especially Tarsus. 
Paul comes from what we can best describe as a a family of means, most likely a family of some sort of wealth. He had an outstanding Greek education. He went to one of those Ivy League schools back then. He went to whatever your choice is, UCLA, USC, or Pierce College where I started. (laughs) Paul, Paul was one of those. Paul was, Paul was a prolific writer. In fact, let me ask you this question. How many books have you written? Oh, that's a big question, right? Now, some of us in the room have written some books. And you know that if you've written some books, that's, that's not an easy deal. Those that haven't written a book is, yeah, that's why I don't write books. It's not an easy deal. Do you know that Paul wrote 13, arguably 13, maybe 14, depending where you fall on Hebrews, uh, uh, 13 of the 27 New Testament books. That's cray-cray. Think about it. Just to write a book's a big deal. Imagine writing a book and getting it published in the Bible. Imagine writing 13 books and getting 13 books published in the Bible. I mean, Paul, Paul was used by God in a massive, massive way. And I'll tell you, God is really smart, not to state the obvious, but God is really smart Because he made Paul, formerly Saul, become the mastermind of the ages in many ways. When you think about it, how is God going to connect for the people? For the people, starting with the Jews first, then the Gentiles. How is he going to connect the Old Testament to the New Testament? He needed somebody that understood the Old Testament and the New Testament. How was, how was God going to connect the Jews to the Gentiles? He needed a person that could toggle back and forth. How, how was he going to create this New Testament uh, perspective and faith from an Old Testament perspective? How was he going to connect those and not contradict those? Well, the Apostle Paul is a perfect candidate to do it. He understood Judaism. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a sharp mind, and he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, and Jesus taught him the New Testament. Jesus taught him the theology of salvation, of the good news of the gospel. You see, after Paul's conversion on Damascus, which we'll talk about, after his conversion, what you have to understand, he went off to Arabia, and that's where he studied the scriptures, And that's where he was taught. In fact, in Galatians 1.12, listen to Paul's own words. He says, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Whoa, you talk about having a great teacher, Jesus. Jesus taught him. He he learned the scriptures from, from Christ. In fact, he learned, he learned how to put down and conquer and crush pagan religion, uh, Greek gods. He learned how to, how to argue the gospel, how to defend the faith. Paul was the one who said in 2 Corinthians, remember what he says in, in chapter 10, he says, he says, you know what? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. He says, we don't fight with flesh and blood. We're not duking it out anymore. That was the Old Testament. They killed a lot of people. New Testament, our battle, our, we rage not to, against flesh and blood, but against principalities and darknesses thereof, Paul says. And a, mind, and a mind that could do it was the Apostle Paul, sharp as a whip, an incredibly rich understanding Not only of the Judaism in which he was raised, but now understanding understanding the gospel itself. It's interesting to note. It's interesting to note that on an ancient manuscript, there's a scribe. And he writes a little note in the margin. And he writes it about the Apostle Paul. And he says, the Apostle Paul, when when he was in towns, he would end up teaching the gospel, basically the book of Romans, five hours a day, six days a week. Did you catch that? You talk about a man that was committed. Five hours a day, six days a week, and then church on Sunday. This guy was up to his eyeballs in theological truth. And he opens up, he's he's just a mere man. We know he's a mere man because he's gonna tell us, he's gonna tell us, "I, I do the things I shouldn't do, and I don't do the things 
that I know I should do, wretched man that I am. What do I call that? A bad case of the normals. Bad case of the normals following Jesus Christ. I do these things I shouldn't do, and I don't do these things I know I should do. Oh, wretched man that I am. That's the sanctification process that the man, the, uh, the apostle Paul went in. Notice number two, number two, not only was he just a, a man, Paul, formerly Saul, notice what he says, Paul the servant. Let's look at the next part of uh, verse one. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. A servant of Christ Jesus. What, what he starts off with is a massive statement. He pulls his business card out. I mean, he could have said a lot of things, right? Paul, church planter extraordinaire. He could have put Paul, the world's greatest evangelist. Paul, formerly Saul, but saw Jesus himself. I mean, he could have had a lot of things on his business card, but he pulls out a card and he says, first and foremost, you want to know who I am? I'm just a, I'm just a servant of Jesus Christ. What Paul says in, in, the, in that phrase, he says, this is what I am and this is who I am. I've gone from Saul to servant. Now, most of us, we love stories of going from rags to riches. <laughs> what he says, I'm gone from riches really just to rags. I just kind of clean up where I need to clean up. Why? Because I'm a doulos, a doulos of the Lord Jesus Christ is the Greek word. Better translated as slave. He says, you want to know who I am? I'm just a slave of Jesus Christ. I, I want you to know that I am a servant of Christ Jesus. And I love how he puts it there. He, he says, I'm a servant of Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ. You know, people often ask me, hey, is, is Christ the last name of Jesus, like Todd Smith? Do you know how painful it is to be called Smith? Everybody doesn't believe me when I do anything. You know, check into a hotel, well, my name's Smith. Yeah, right. <laughs> but that's my last name, right? You have a last name. Is Christ Jesus' last name? No, it's not. It's his title. It's his title. It means anointed one. It has the idea in the, in the Hebrew, it has the idea of, um, well, it has the idea of Messiah. It's his, it's his formal title. He, he says, I want you to understand I'm a servant of Christ. This anointed Jesus, this messianic Jesus, that's who I serve. You see, Paul's whole life, now don't miss this because you're going to miss the point of the sermon. The whole epistle that Paul writes is all revolving around one person, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul met Jesus in Acts 9 on the Damascus Road, he was conquered and captivated by one person, and that's Jesus Christ. He, his entire ministry revolves not around a religion, but it revolves around a person, and it's Christ Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. We know in Acts chapter 9, and I don't have time to go there, we do assign homework at Crossroads, so those of you visiting might want to try another church because we have homework. You need to read Acts 9 because that's the conversion of Paul. Remember, Paul, formerly Saul, was on his way to slaughter Christians. He was on his way to persecute Christians. In fact, he was going to round them up and bring them back. And there he was with his contingent that was following with him, and he's doing the persecuting thing, and he's going down the road. And it says that in the noonday sun, he was blinded. And when he was blinded, literally scales came over his eyes, and he couldn't see squat. And he's standing there, and Jesus is appearing to him, but he can't see him. But he knows. Why? Because Christ grabbed his heart at that moment. And remember what Paul cries out? Lord, Lord, is that you? And Paul, this persecuting Saul, this blasphemer, this murderer, this executioner, this Saddam Hussein type person is standing there there in the Middle East on a dusty, hot road, blind as a bat. He's a bumbling fool at this moment, and he's crying out, Lord, Lord, is that you? And what was happening? <laughs> God was doing something amazing. He was, grabbing, he was grabbing this man's heart. And he was going to be, like Ephesians says, 
he was going to make Paul a trophy of his. And he was going to use him to become the greatest evangelist the world has ever seen. And now that we live down river, we all, we all owe a ton, a ton to the Apostle Paul because many of us have come to Christ and if you were to follow your heritage back, it would come possibly from one of the churches that he planted himself. The Apostle Paul, in a moment, was a blind, bumbling fool, but he was going to be saved by Christ. Why? Why, why did his entire life revolve around Christ Jesus? Because at that moment on that road, Christ conquered and captivated that man. Remember, everywhere he went, he wanted to preach one message. Remember what it was? He told the church at Corinth, Remember the first message I gave you? He says to the church of Corinth, I preached how to raise teenagers. <laughs> Do you remember that message? Is that what he preached? No. no, he says, I came of first importance and I preached one thing. I preached Jesus Christ crucified. That was his message. He was captivated by Christ. He was conquered by Christ. He, he, he became, notice what he became, a servant of Christ. What's he telling the, the people at Rome? He tells them, I'm just one of you. I put my tuna, tunic on the same way you do. I'm just, I'm just a servant of Christ. You see, this is the big difference between religion and Christianity. Religion revolves around rules. Christianity revolves, revolves around a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. You can take Muhammad out of Islam and you still have Islam. You can take Buddha out of Buddhism and you still have Buddhism. But you can't take Christ out of Christianity because it's Christ who we follow. It's Christ who saves us. There is no message without Christ. And Paul says, I, 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 am, I am absolutely conquered by Christ. And today's Christianity in America, it's, it's filled with personalities and plans and programs. But true Christianity is to be filled with a person. We're followers not of Christianity, we're followers of Christ. That's who we follow. Religion is man's attempt to create rules to somehow love God. And you know how these rules work. Man is desperately sinful. And so we create all these ways that we think we love God. We create all kinds of crazy rules. Some people create a rule that says fly airplanes into buildings because that's how you love God. See, we, we, we follow a person, and his name is Jesus Christ because he's the one who knows how to please the Father. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Paul the servant, now number three, Paul the apostle. Look at the end of verse one. You're thinking, we're still in verse one? <laughs> Paul the apostle, he's called to be an apostle. He's called to be an apostolo or apostello it is the Greek word. Apostello simply means to be commissioned by the king. It wasn't, it's not a churchy word. Uh, you could be commissioned by any, any king to go do something. Yeah, he was commissioned, he was commissioned by the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He saw Jesus Christ. To be an apostle, number one, you had to, you had to see Jesus. People today that claim that they're apostles, the, the biggest problem that they have is they've never ever been seen with Jesus. And the first, the first requirement is that you had to see the resurrected Christ in Acts chapter 1. Uh, what's interesting, Paul says, I'm, I'm called to be an apostle, I've been sent by the king. And that's why wherever Paul w went, if you notice that wherever Paul went, uh, w one of two things would happen. Either a revival would break out or a riot would break out. Wherever Paul went when he was commissioned by the king, he either ended up with a plant of a church or he ended up in a prison. Wherever Paul went because he was on mission, he either went, he either went before a church and planted it or he went before some council and got condemned. Paul was sent, and his life was in fuego for Christ. It was on fire for Christ. Why? Because notice that word. Circle that word. He was called. 
Same word we're going to see about each of us. You were called. Paul says, I was called. He was a called man. Paul was not a self-appointed man. He wasn't like, hey, I think I can, I can lead the charge here. I think I'm going to kind of take over Christianity. No, he was called by Christ. He was commissioned by the king. He lived a called life. He, he understood, as we talked last week, he remembered what his why was. Why, why, why he existed and why he went hard 24-7, 365, all the way until he got to Rome where they severed his head from his body. But why did he do, why, why, did, he, why did he go so hard? It's because he was called by the king. He was commissioned by the king. And by the end of verse 7, you're going to see that you and I are called by the same king. Which is a great reminder as Christians, we talked about last week, our why. We have to understand that we need to live our life off our calling, not our circumstances. If I live off circumstances, I'm in the ditch by Tuesday. Because circumstances change constantly. But what fires me up is that I believe I'm on mission for the Lord Jesus Christ. That I have a calling on my life. That God wants to use me in some way. Now, that's not just for pastors. That's for Christ followers. God didn't save you to put you in some, some trophy chest. He saved you to use you. You were called to Christ. And Paul says, what compels me is my, my calling. My circumstances, well, they're really bad. Shipwreck, bitten by snakes, <laughs> beaten, stoned. I mean, he's got a really interesting resume. But he says, it's not the circumstances that drive me. It's my calling. That's what, that's what wakes me up each morning, is that I'm called by Christ. Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 6, you were bought with a price. Therefore, what? Glorify God with your body, with your life. We, we, you, you, we were picked. You and I were picked with a price. The Father paid one Jesus Christ for us. And you were picked by Christ. Hey, I grew up in the day where you played street football and you went home when the street lights came on. Can I get an amen in the house this morning? <laughs> And the way you found out where your friends were is you went down the street and looked where all the bicycles were. No texting. No find my phone, find my friends. <laughs> and we'd play in the asphalt of the street with cars. Can you imagine today, parents saying, yeah, go out and play in the street. <laughs> what? What? We did. We played in the street with tough skins. Can I get an amen for tough skins? <laughs> I remember how it went. You know how you, you, you meet out on the street, meet by the street uh, light. Two team captains. They start picking teams of the neighbors. I remember. I, I was there. There a lot. They, they're picking the players, picking Mark, picking Kenny, picking Steve. And I'm over here, pick me, pick me. <laughs> they pick Brian. They pick Henry. Pick me, pick me. And then they, they, they start picking the girls. <laughs> Pastor Todd's still over there, pick me, pick me. <laughs> and then, you know, by the time they're done, they flip a coin, who gets Todd? <laughs> I'll tell you this, loved ones. My hope doesn't come from the fact that I wasn't picked by the team captain, my hope comes from the fact that I was picked by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's who picked me. That's who picked me. Paul says I was picked too. I was called to be an apostle. You, 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 you guys are called to be something. Basically light of the world, but, they've, but God has also called you on mission for something. Paul says I was picked you see, our God is purposeful. He saved Paul. He called Paul. He set Paul apart. And of all people, he picks Paul. One of the great American stories is about President Abraham Lincoln. And he had a lot of critics, a lot of enemies. 
One of his staunchest enemies was Edwin Stanton. In fact, in the early days before Lincoln's presidency, Edwin Stanton would call Lincoln an ape from Africa. So we think politics have gotten harsh now. It was back then too. What's interesting is when Abraham Lincoln became president, he filled his cabinet with many of his enemies. Edwin Stanton became the secretary of war. The guy who had called him the ape from Africa now sat at the table with the president because the president understood his giftedness. And it was Stanton who said the night that Abraham was shot and killed, as he bled out on that bed, he once said of Abraham, Abraham Lincoln, he once called him the ape from Africa, and now he says as he took his last breath, he said, now he belongs to the ages. He picked his enemy. What I find so fascinating, and one of the greatest arguments for the veracity of the gospel is the fact that God picked Saul of Tarsus to be Apostle Paul. I mean, come on, right? If you're going to pick somebody, you're like, to be an apostle, you're like, hey, I want to find somebody who's at least for me. I want him to, I don't want, I want somebody like, just like he's kind of favorable. I get favorable ratings from him or her. And all of a sudden, we see, we see God picking his staunch en- enemy to be the apostle Paul. You see, he he was the guy that was breathing out threats, slander, persecuting, blaspheming. And Paul tells us in verse 1, he was called to be an apostle. I mean, it's funny to think about his resume. Well, what? So, Paul or Saul, you're you're running for apostle? Uh, Of who? Of of Jesus. Okay. What are some of the things that you've done for them? Well, I've blasphemed them, I've persecuted them, I've killed a lot of Christians. Oh, you'd be perfect as an apostle. (laughs) You know what that tells me? Is anybody in this room, as far away as you think you are from the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be saved. If the staunch enemy of Jesus Christ can be saved, you can be saved. Paul the Apostle. Number four, Paul the Evangelist. Paul the Evangelist. Notice notice the end of verse one. He says, I've been set apart for the gospel of God. I've been set apart. That that phrase set apart is a play on words. The Greek word is actually the word for Pharisee. It's the idea that's what Pharisee means, to be set apart. I think Paul has a great play on words here. He says, I've been set apart. (laughs) I was the Pharisee of Pharisees, but now I'm the Pharisee of Christ. I'm a Pharisee of the gospel. I've been set apart to be used by God. I'm here to preach the gospel, the evangelion, the good news. This this word gospel, evangelium in, in the Greek, is used 60 times in this book. Paul's screaming out, flashing red lights, gospel, 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 gospel. And he says, I've been set apart. I'm the Pharisee. I've been set apart to preach the good news. Same thing he told the church at Galatia. He says in Galatians chapter 1, just listen, verse 15. But when he who set me apart, watch this, before I was born. Holy Toledo Batman. That's when Paul was called. Before his mom and dad even got together. He says, before I was born, God Almighty called me, set me apart to preach the gospel. He says, it it is he who called me by his grace and was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him. There it is again. He's about Christ and Christ alone. See, Paul understood that when God saves you, hear me, Christian, when God saves you, he saves you to send you. He saves you to send you, and Paul knew this. Notice verse 2, he says, this gospel, which, which he, God, promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. He says, this isn't new. 
Why? Because Paul knew the Old Testament. He knew it backwards and forwards. He had read the prophets. Did you know there are 333 solid prophecies of the coming of Jesus Christ? Written, written some 500 to 1,500 years, all the way back to Genesis 3 we saw last week. And there will be a guy that will crush the head of the serpent. And that's exactly what Jesus did at the cross. 333 prophecies. Paul says, this isn't new. So a lot of people say, oh, yeah, but Jesus just manipulated the system and pulled it off. Really? So he figured out how to pick his place of birth, Bethlehem, before he was born? Joseph, Mary. In the tummy, he says, Mary, get to Bethlehem. <laughs> right? Babies don't speak. They kick. Oh, he, he pulled it off. Really? So when he was dead, 500 years before this, they said that they would cast lots for his clothing. After he was dead, he kind of woke up for a minute and said, throw the dice. <laughs> Went back to death. It doesn't make sense. The gospel's not new. Paul's not offering something new. This has been, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. What were the scriptures to Paul? The Old Testament scriptures. Look at verse 3. He says this gospel, the, 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 this gospel is concerning his son. A lot of people want to make the gospel a lot of things today, but make no mistake about it. Paul says the gospel is concerning his son who descended from David according to the flesh. What is he saying? He says Jesus, Jesus was a man. He descended. That word descended in the Greek is a compound word, expermatos, expermatos. I won't go any farther. But it tells us that Jesus Christ, God Almighty, became an embryo in a young teenager's stomach. He was fully man. He was a descendant of David. According to the flesh, he had flesh. That the divine God, at a moment of time, stepped into time and came, became part of historical account. In verse 4, and was declared to be the Son of God, was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness. The power, the power. We always think of the power as the res resurrecting power. But part of the power here is that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He had the spirit of holiness. He, he lived a perfect life. I, I always joke about James, the half-brother, telling on Jesus. Mom, Jesus kicked me. Mary says, I don't think so, James. I just don't think so. Why? Because it's the power, according to the Spirit, he lived a perfect life, the life I've always wanted to live. He lived it. And the power, of a, by his resurrection from the dead, it came bursting forth. What, what is it? What are you, what, 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 Paul, what are you saying? He descended from David. He's a man. He's declared to be the Son of God, verse 4, and he's fully God. Is Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ God? Answer yes or no. Yes. Is Jesus Christ a man? Answer yes or no. Yes. yes. You say that doesn't make sense. I know, you get slurpy brain. <laughs> but I'm very comfortable having a God that knows more than I do. Amen. Just an easy thing for me. He's fully God, fully man. Why? Because it would take a man to pay for man's sin. It would take a God-man to pay for all man's sin. Number, number five. These are fast. These are fast. Paul the pastor, verses 5 and 6. This is where you see his pastoral heart. He says, through whom, through Christ, we have received grace, and for him, apostleship, to bring about one thing. Bring about one thing. Notice what it is. Obedience of faith. Oh, oh, so Christopher. Obedience of the faith. I've heard that before. I heard that last week at the, end of book, at the end of the book of Romans. What did he write the book for? Obedience of the faith. He says, notice what he says. It's not obedience to faith. It's not a bunch of rules. 
It's, it's the obedience of faith. Why? Because the nature of faith obeys. The essence of saving faith is obedience. You can't have saving faith without obedience. If you have obedience, you have saving faith. So he says, as a pastor, he says, I want you to understand, I, I'm calling you to one thing, obedience of the faith, for the sake of his name among all nations, including, including you who are called, there's that word, called, same word for Paul, called, to belong to Jesus Christ. Lastly, Paul, the author, he finishes in verse 7, with his salutation, he says in verse 7, Now to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called, same word, to be saints, to be saints. There's only two humans in the wor world today, the saints and the ain'ts. That's all there is. You're either a saint or you're an ain't. Paul says, you know what? I'm writing to you Christ believers who are saints Notice what he says. He says here very clearly to those of you in Rome. He's not writing to the church in Rome. Or excuse me, he's not writing to the church of Rome. Remember he did that at Ephesus, to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Galatia, to the church at Philippi. Here's what he says. He doesn't say the, the, church, the church of Rome. He says the church in Rome, meaning this just Christians in Rome. Some of us in this room have a bucket list. Don't worry, we won't have a shared time, but you got a bucket list. Paul's bucket list, top of the list, go to Rome, go to Rome, go to Rome. You're going to see that over and over again through this life. He wanted to get to Rome. He, he longed to get to Rome because he knew there was a group of believers. And you say, well, how, how, did, how, how, how did these believers get there if, if Paul had never been there? Uh, there's no documented trip by Paul to Rome. There's no documented trip by Peter to Rome even. Some people say, well, Peter established the church. Well, he, Paul tells us at the end of the book in Romans, he says, I don't build on other people's foundation. I'm coming to you to start something, a church. Paul wouldn't have gone to Rome if Peter was already taking care of it. So how, how did all these Christians get there? How did all these Christians get there that Paul would write to them? Bible over here, Pastor Todd over here. <laughs> I think, I think, I think that you find the answer in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. It says that many came from all around the world basically then. And the phrase simply is this, and some were from Rome. I think these Jews came back into Jerusalem for Pentecost. They heard the gospel. We know, we know the, the, the Spirit of God moved on thousands. Remember in one day 3,000 come to Christ. I think some of those Hebrew Roman citizens got saved and they went back to Rome. They shared Christ. And now Paul says, there's a group of Christians I want to write to you. We know in Romans 16, he knows a lot of them by name. And then he closes, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how he says in these last few verses, he says, you belong to Jesus. You're loved by God. You're called to be saints. And he even finishes with the fact that Jesus Christ is our Lord. What's crazy, in the first seven verses, you smart people have already figured this out. In these first seven verses, Paul uses the name Jesus, Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. It refers to Jesus. In seven verses, he uses it six times. In verse 5, he says, we're doing it, we're doing it for his name's sake. He says, you know, I know what the gospel is. The gospel, the gospel isn't a social gospel. The gospel is simply this. The gospel is concerning his son, that he saves sinners from eternal punishment. He uses them for his mission here on earth to spend eternity with Christ. That's the gospel. Now, the gospel trickles down and changes our lives, but the gospel is concerning his son for his namesake. Why? Because Paul was all about the name of Jesus. If you read Paul's letters, the 13 letters, you're going to find out he writes on one subject matter. You know what it is? Jesus. It's Jesus. 
Well, I want to learn about, I want, did Paul write anything on parenting? Squat, nothing. I mean, he gives, some, he gives some, some, some encouragement to parents, but he's not a parent. He wrote about one subject matter. Well, what was Paul's kind of, his philosophy of e- economics? We don't know. He wrote on one person, and you know what his name was? His name was what? Jesus. His name was what, church? Jesus. It, was, it was Jesus. We get captivated with everybody but Jesus. As I've been talking to many people about going into Romans, most Christians have a lot of questions about one subject. Most Christians I run up against, oh, you're going into Romans. So, so Romans 9. Romans 9. Calvinism. Are you, at Romans 9, where, where are you going to go in Romans 9, 10, and 11? Where are you going to go with, with, with John Calvin and Calvinism? John Calvin, well, you know... And it's, it's sad to me because us Christians spend more time discussing John Calvin than we do Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul in heaven right now talking to John Calvin? Like, you're killing me, dude. <laughs> you're killing me. All the church down there is all tongue-twisted over Romans 9 because of you. Let me tell you, that's important theology, and we'll get there. But we're here to study one person, and his name is Jesus Christ, because we serve Christ and Christ alone. I close because I'm reminded of the 6th century monk who wrote these words. Christ be with me. Christ within me. Christ behind me. Christ before me. Christ beside me. Christ to win me. Christ to comfort and restore me. Christ beneath, beneath me. Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. It's Christ. We serve Christ. The message of the gospel is Christ. I say to some of us in this room, you're about to, you're about to blow up on your spouse. It's about Christ. You're about ready to walk out of your marriage. It's about Christ. You're about to take the shady business deal. It's about Christ. You're about to walk away from the faith. It's about Christ. It's Christ whom we serve. It's Christ whom we love. It's Christ whom we obey. It's the Lord Jesus Christ that saved us. Amen. Amen. Father, we pray that we would be all about one person, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Father, may our study through Romans be about Jesus. May we understand the richness of the gospel, the sacrifice of the Savior, the love of the Father, the work of the Spirit. And Father, would you conform us to the image of your Son because it's Christ in whom you were well pleased. Father, when we come to the last verse in Romans 16, may all of us be more like Christ than we are today. We pray this in his precious, perfect name, the name of Jesus Christ. And all his kids said, amen. Amen. Sorry I went long. Martin Lloyd-Jones, 13 weeks, so got to give me a little little credit there. Um, Before you leave, just before you step out, I want to make you aware we'll have prayer counselors up front. We'd love to pray for anybody here in this room. Uh, we'd love for those of you that are new, and I see new faces out there. I see new faces every week, new faces out there. Go by that starting point, that little um, uh, spot there in the lobby. Um, it says starting point. We'd love to give you a gift before you leave here and just say thanks for being here this morning. And then this is my last plug to you men. You know, this is do it here, do it now. Like you're right here at church, so go out in the lobby, get signed up. You can either do it on your phone electronically or you can go right to the 
right to the sign-up place there uh, in the grow area and get signed up, and then we'll see you men next Friday night. Otherwise, Crossroads, you're loved by your Savior, Jesus Christ. Have a great week. Stay faithful.